good evening friends so i'll be giving a very brief overview maybe in over 4 to 5 minutes on af in icu causes and concerns so this is more of a context setting for the next article rtcr trial that will be discussed by our colleagues and friends so it's just 4 to 5 minutes overview on um, atrial fibrillation in icu and and uh, and the problem that it creates so if you look at uh, all the arrhythmias in icu af constitutes one of the commonest arrhythmias. So it's the most common arrhythmias in ICU. And for all the trainees, I think you, you would be quite uh, uh, sort of a uh, competent enough to identify the AF. So AFs look something like this. It is irregularly irregular. So these ECGs are sometimes shown in exams and very often, uh, you know, we would expect one, one or two trainees who may struggle with this also. So it's irregularly irregular. And they do have isoelectric baseline. And there are certain criteria. So obviously there is no P wave. P waves would be absent in the ECG. And QRS will be small. So it's a narrow complex tachyarrhythmia. So QRS will be less than 120 seconds. So, so that is a typical. And most of you would possibly recognize this quite intuitively in your practice. And why does this AF happen? So obviously the whole atrial activity happens in the right atrium where the SA node is there. So there is an uncoordinated activity or activation of the right atrium that happens and which consequently tends to get perpetuated and there is a progressive sort of a worsening of the right atrial mechanical function because of the dysrhythmia that sets in. So there is an inappropriate and uncoordinated activation of the whole RA electrical activity that happens, which gets perpetuated if it is not, if the underlying cause or the triggers are not corrected. So this is important. So acute AF in ICU is not uncommon. Any patient who is sick in ICU are at a risk of developing AF, which is the commonest arrhythmia in ICU. So it is good for all trainees to know the broad overview on the causes of AF. So the simplistic way of looking at it is there is cardiac specific causes and non-cardiac specific causes. So that's the easiest way to remember. So cardiac specific is if some if any of the patients has had a previous history of AF and they come to ICU for any critical condition or a disease condition, so they're at a higher risk of developing AF. So someone who develops MI or cardiac event ischemic heart disease or acute coronary disease, so they're at a risk of developing AF. So if it's a cardiac, Invariably, it will be due to some coronary event that have happened or a previous history of EF. Or patients with heart failure, with a, with a systolic heart failure, with a low ejection fraction, or diastolic heart failure, or heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, so on and so on. So any patient who comes with heart failure, they are at a risk of developing EF. And of course, the fourth important cardiac cause would be any valvular heart disease. Someone has had a severe mitral stenosis, so on and so forth. So they are at test risk of. So these are very simplistic way of the cardiac causes. So any heart failure, ACS, valvular heart disease, and previous history. So these are the cardiac causes. But what we are interested in ICU, who are at risk of developing AF without cardiac problems. So obesity is an important risk. So any patient who is obese, and the studies have shown they are at an increased risk of developing AF by up to the risk increases by up to 49% of the obese patients are at the risk of developing AF. And someone who is taking ethanol or smoker, so, so especially someone has had a huge alcohol binge, uh, so they are at a higher risk of developing atrial fibrillation. So this is interesting. So even a diabetes, so diabetics are at a higher risk of developing AF. So this was the last ep large epidemiological study that came from Norway. We showed that pre-diabetic, are at a risk for AF in 20% of the population, are at a risk for developing AF. This becomes important in the light of the study that will be discussed, which is arteria, uh, arteria study, where we are looking at uh, subclinical atrial fibrillation and management with apixaban. So if that becomes pertinent in this cohort of patients, especially diabetics who are pre-diabetic, they are at 20% risk of developing AF. And diabetics, they are at a risk of developing AF in 28%. So this is the sort of epidemiological data we have. So, and it's not uncommon to see patients, half of um, more than half of the ICU patients who are diabetics and even hypertension. So the risk of a patient developing AF in hypertensives is about 50%. So it means the significant chunk of ICU patients who come have burden of diabetes and hypertension. And we are dealing with a 
population who are at a risk of developing AF in about 50% of these patients. So this becomes important in the light of this particular study, RT-VCR study, which will be discussed because it's a subclinical AF where we are contemplating on using anticoagulation. And anyone with a thyro hyperthyroidism or thyrotoxic crisis, so they are at a risk of developing AF. So this is just a pictorial representation of what are the causes and someone with a chronic kidney disease also are at a higher risk of AF. So you can re remember this picture. So diabetic, hypertension and CKD are not uncommon in ICU and cardiac specific causes. And obesity also is an important factor. So in ICU, what is more important is what are the triggers? So these are some of the background conditions which puts them at a risk of developing AF. But for them to develop AF, there are certain triggers within ICU which makes them more vulnerable to develop AF. And so what are these triggers? So dyselectrolytemia, so any dyselectrolytemia in ICU, it can be hypokalemia, hyperkalemia, hypomagnesemia, hypermagnesemia, hypo, hypercalcemia, hypophosphatemia. So any of these, this or even uremia for that matter, because we did mention AKI with uh, urea going up, all these potent risk. So any dyselectrolytemia potents a risk for developing AF. And someone who is on vasopressors in ICU, so if they are on especially inotropes like dobutamine, they are at a much higher risk of developing AF. And hypovolemia, so huge volume disturbances, so hypovolemia also is a very important. So these are typically seen in ICU, and these act as a trigger for someone developing AF. And of course, sepsis is one of the commonest admission in ICU, and sepsis is an important trigger for someone who may be vulnerable to like diabetes, obesity, hypertension, which are so common admissions in ICU, these can act as a trigger for perpetuating the risk of AF. And some of the drugs like beta agonists or any of these drugs can uh, act as a trigger for atrial fibrillation. And even simple things like ventilator dyssynchrony has shown to be a trigger for inciting or developing AF in a patient. So these are some of the triggers in ICU. And uh, in ICU, obviously, we do procedures, so right heart catheterization or CVC insertion. So if it goes and touches the RV wall, you, we all know, most of the intensivists would know, so this would act as a trigger for developing uh, arrhythmia. So AF also can be perpetuated by some of these procedures, especially the right heart catheterization. So this is simplistically the triggers, and I'm sure most of the trainees, it would be very intuitive that most ICU patients will have one or more of these sort of a triggers which may incite the onset of AF. So, and what are the concerns? Uh, so, we spoke about causes, then we spoke about the triggers. So, the, is AF relevant in ICU? Is it concerning? Yes, it is concerning because it can cause a lot of hemodynamic instability. So, basically, there are two major concerns in patients who develop AF. One is obviously the cardiac performance get affected. They become more hemodynamically unstable and the risk of thromboembolism. I think the article that we discussed is to more to address how we mitigate the risk of thromboembolism or arterial thrombosis that happen. So hemodynamic instability is something that happens, especially if someone is on vasopressors, you will see when anyone develops AF, the dose of vasopressors increases, acidosis worsens, and tissue hypoperfusion sets in. And this is a study which is shown in patients with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, if they have a concomitant presence of AF, the mortality risk goes up by 11%. So, which means heart failure, we see a lot of patients now coming to ICU with heart failure with preserved or reduced ejection fraction. If this is compounded by an onset of AF, so it has a direct sort of a correlation with increase in the mortality. And of course, the AF can act as a trigger or as a risk for ongoing acute coronary syndrome or ischemia in the heart. So, so it can be a trigger for worsening ischemia in the heart. So that is another aspect. Because there is hemodynamic instability, tissue perfusion gets affected. So risk of AKA also is much higher in patients with uh, who develop AF in ICU. And this was shown by a study from UK group. We showed the organ dysfunction secondary to hypoperfusion that happens following acute AF in ICU is also higher. Uh, so, the, so the organ dysfunction is something that one should keep in mind can happen as a result of acute AF in ICU. So what is of interest and what is the study that you would be discussing is how we mitigate the risk of patients developing thromboembolism, uh, especially the stroke, whether this can uh, reduce the risk of stroke because AF has clearly shown as an important risk factor uh, 
a patient developing stroke. So now the article that will be discussed is more to address with this. What is the risk? So so the risk, especially the subclinical AF, if someone has even that has shown there is 2.5 fold higher risk of them developing a stroke. So if it is a clinical AF, the risk is much higher than that. So so it, it constitutes significant risk for someone developing a stroke if someone has a, is a clinical AF. Let alone clinical, subclinical AF itself, there is a risk of 2.5 times higher of them developing stroke. And of course, they can have pulmonary thromboembolism also as a risk following AF. So any arterial systemic uh, embolization is something that, that is a huge risk in patients who develop AF. So, so that's about it. So we will possibly now after this, I think a journal review, I think there'll be a lot more data that will be presented about, uh, uh, you know, what is the risk associated with regards to stroke and whether anticoagulation is something that should be used in subclinical. So the article that is going to be discussed is on subclinical AF. So, but what has been clearly shown is in with clinical AF, patients who have a clinical manifestations of AF, Anticoagulation is something that needs to be considered. But in ICU, if it is an acute AF, where it is a short term, without a previous history, would we put, contemplate putting them on anticoagulation? We don't know the answer. So all this is something we can discuss. So I request all our listeners to submit your valuable work to a journal of acute care, which comes out every three months. You can visit my website to rehab to this. So thank you. Thank you, one and all.